Back to stay adults in the conversation now. Equatorial Guinea will on Sunday hold its presidential, parliamentary, and local elections where the 80 year old incumbent president, Theodore Obiang Nguema, under his Democratic Party of Equatorial Guinea, PDGE, will seek re election for the sixth time. As the world's longest serving leader, Obiang, who has spent 43 years in office, is contesting against two other candidates. Andre Solo Oldo of the Convergence for Social Democracy, CPDS, the sole authorized opposition party, and Benaventura Monsu Asumu of the Social Democratic Coalition Party, PCSD, a historic ally of the PDGE. Now, since independence from Spain in 1968, the oil producing nation of about 1.5 million people has only had two presidents. Obiang and his uncle Francisco Masaya Singema, who was removed in a coup by Obiang in 1979. Obiang has been accused of Muslim dissent, uh, freedom of expression, and embezzlement accusations, which the government has denied. Does the opposition stand a chance against the 80 year old incumbent president? Uh, joining us to discuss this is Archike Chude, a global affairs analyst who joins us from Nigeria's commercial capital. Uh, Lagos. A very warm welcome to you, Achika, and it's a pleasure to have you join us on the conversation. Yeah, same here too. Thank you. Now, Achika, uh, Sunday's elections, uh, the president is 80 years old, is going for sixth uh, term in office uh, since he planned a coup against his uh, notorious uncle, Francisco Masas in Gema in 1979. He's remained in office. Are these just uh, formalities? or are the results of the elections a foregone conclusion? What do you make of uh, the current political situation in Equatorial Guinea? Yeah, well, we must also forget talking about his uncle, uh, that uh, after he ousted him in a coup, he had him shot two months later. Uh, you know, um, uh, so, well, obviously talking about uh, the election, <laughs> it's obvious everybody knows that it's a formality. At the very last time, the very last election, he won landslide, his party won landslide, 93% of the votes uh, counted in his favor. Um, and, and so uh, there is nothing new about uh, Equatorian, Guinea, Equatorial Guinea politics. It's about, uh, you know, the Nguema family. He is uh, the president, uh, he's 80 years, the son is the vice president. It is speculated that the son will take over from him after he leaves power. Uh, so they, you know, at the political level, I mean, out of uh, the lower chamber, uh, he out of a hundred uh, seats, uh, they have ninety nine, and then the, the upper chamber in the Senate, it's every body uh, is uh, from his party. Uh, so you're talking about uh, a dynasty, um, and so this election is just a, a charade. Uh, it's just that they are holding it uh, for the sake of a uh, giving impression uh, to the people that uh, the demo a democracy is still in place. Of course, you're going to have international observers, uh, both from uh, the West and then from Africa. But whether would that would translate to anything meaningful in terms of ensuring the credibility of election, it's a different, uh, you know, situation. Or, or, you know, all this all together. Uh, he has is running the opposition out of town. And then when it is close to an election like this, the police begin to write, round up people on the guys that uh, they are planning to attack uh, the you know, Western uh, uh, interests. And so it, it's a recurring uh, decimal in the uh, uh, Equatorial Guinea. And it is the sad story of uh, Africa. Uh, we, we, we have that all over the continent. Uh, people in their 70s and their 80s uh, who believe that they are the best thing to happen to their country and that without them, uh, then uh, the country will uh, uh, will fall apart, and the people will accept it. And so the election, oh, it's, it's, everybody knows it's uh, just going to be a formality. Now, have the people, you said the people have accepted it. I, I, I want to put that question back to you. I mean, the people in Equatorial Guinea, have they really accepted it, or uh, they're just muscled by the ruling government? Well, it's, it's what happens now. So, I mean, the, the people are ultimately the people are part of it, part of their own problem. And uh, because uh, democracy is a democracy. Uh, so a democracy is, uh, we must not forget uh, the traditional definition of, of a democracy, government of the people, for the people, by the people. And so, uh, but what we are seeing increasingly in many parts of Africa, including Equatorial Guinea, is government of the few for the few, you know, and by the few. 
I mean, in a country where you you, you know uh, you can you talk of widespread poverty, you talk about a youthful population that is not a meaningfully engaged in employment, uh, you talk about uh, other economic uh, 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 issues, problems, uh, factories, manufacturing is not uh, exactly taking place uh, in in India, um, and and then and then every time people go out. Uh, to express themselves in an election, which is supposed to be a scorecard of uh, the political leadership, they keep on returning the people that have kept them in misery. I think the only way one can explain it is that um, uh, the people have put have been put in a place where there is no choice anymore. And uh, so even when you have, sometimes it, it is, even the opposition sometimes that you have in those places are contrived by the government itself. Some of them, what happens, you know, in dictatorships is that even they are the ones that generate the opposition uh, to themselves, and then uh, also somehow money is exchanged hands because they just need to give impression to the people, especially the outside world, that uh, there is you know opposition politics taking place here, and that this is the full expression of a democracy, and and and, and so um, so when the people have to go out, the people have to vote. Uh, the, the opposition is being muzzled one way or the other. Uh, the airspaces are being taken up in terms of uh, publicity and uh, advertisement on radio and television. It's all been taken uh, up by, by the government of the day. Uh, the, the posters are not allowed of opposition members, so they don't even have the resources in the first place uh, to even uh, uh, be in the public space through uh, that advertisement and, and all that, and then you know printing of posters and the rest. So it's an uneven match. Any way you look at it, you cannot, you, it's an uneven match. And so what do you expect ultimately is that the people are going to go and then they are going to just go along with what they've always known. And that is uh, uh, the, the president and his party. Now, Chike, no country is an island. And Equatorial Guinea is a member of the United Nations and African Union. The African Union has what it calls the uh, peer review mechanism where, you know, this former heads of states or head, current heads of states, they come together and they look at, okay, what are we doing wrong in this country? Uh, what should happen? And how do we ensure good governance? If you look at a country like Okotoro Guinea, it should, it, its per capita income should be at the level of, it should be commensurate to a level of Switzerland or Singapore, because you have just 1.5 million people and enormous oil and gas resources and riches, but it doesn't, there's, there's so much widespread debt poverty and uh, the civil society space is barely existent. So what do they discuss? And what have they been discussing at the African Union level for 43 years? How does it get away with this? And also, right. uh, let, let's about also it. talk about Western interests, this oil and gas interest. Would they rather have a family? Because uh, there are cases in France where the junior Obiang, Theodorin, He's had his car seized and millions of dollars have been seized. The other day he was in Brazil with over $3 million cash and it was seized uh, from him. They see all these things, but why do they just uh, look the other way as long as their economic interests is be, uh, are being served? Look, people have made the argument that Africa cannot, cannot be saved until Africa saves, saves itself. And so the redemption of Africa has to start from Africa. You know, they're not just the political leaders. I think it was even the say you're talking about France, uh, the former French France uh, uh, French leader, the uh, post-war French leader. Trying to remember his name now, who said that um, wars are too important to be left in the hands of um, soldiers. Charles and so I would posit that uh, that politics is so important; it's too important to be left in the hands of politicians. So people also have to play a major role in checkmating you know, their political leadership and holding them accountable. Um, of course, you talk about the poverty situation, which is very true. And like you just, you know, said, where you look at the population and the fact that, of course, they have about maybe the third highest GDP in Africa, and maybe because of that population. Uh, but again, the GDP doesn't, even if it is favorable, doesn't automatically translate uh, into the health of the people, the economic health of the people, because there's over 80% poverty uh, in, in Equatorial Guinea. So what are the uh, African leaders talking about? Don't forget that the African Union is, a, is an old boss club. And, uh, you know, sometimes you don't want to throw the a stone into the marketplace for fear that it could strike somebody that uh, you know. And, and, and so uh, we have a situation where, you know, there are other African leaders who have found themselves in this same situation. What are they going to do? 
in Sudan, the man in Sudan was there for about 30 something years. Mm. We also had a situation in Egypt before uh, the, the former president Mubarak you know, was removed. He was there for almost close to 40 years. In Cameroon, we have somebody that is pushing 40 years. Mm. Uh, before Mo Robert Mugabe died, he had been there for decades. And so you have pockets of this, then you have the ones that have been there for like 15, 20, 25 years and still pushing. Uh, even where we have uh, the uh, light, you know, the people have described the, uh, um, Rwanda as uh, the light of Africa in terms of what is going on there, the development and so on. Politically, we are beginning to have a regression where mm -hmm. the president has also extended the, you know, his uh, tenure. So these are the things we are saying. And so are you going to talk about the African leaders sitting, you know, over the liquidation of their own interests? So that is part of the problem. So until our, you know, African leaderships get serious, but they're not going to get serious on their own. The people have to make them to get serious. And so that is a dilemma. That is a conundrum. It's, it's, a, it's a, you know, I can't tell you that, look, we have all the, I have a solution to what is going on, mm -hmm. but uh, it has to emanate from the people. It has to flow from the people. And that is the only way we can stop this because this is absolute nonsense. You are telling us that, you know, for 43 years you have been in power. You have not done anything new. The, the, the country is still mired in all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, economic uh, crisis, uh, you know, and then uh, we, we want, uh, then the, you keep on uh, presenting yourself to the people and okay. the people Africa, keep on before, bringing you back. You and we think that we're going to... Sorry to yeah. cut you in there. When you talk about the people, the people, the people and African leaders, now, there's still the question of the constitution that most times, oftentimes, we see constitutions being changed uh, to suit the leading leaders, the, the current leaders. Now, is there a way to restrain the power of the executive over the constitution in a way that it does not favor them and that the people get to have a say in administration? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's the power of resistance. Uh, the people have to say, no, we cannot, we cannot continue to put up with this nonsense. I think that is just it. And unfortunately, that can only come as a result of uh, maybe social upheaval, you know, and a anarchical situation. What else do you do? The only other way is to get the military to come in. And of course, we've always argued that military rule is an aberration to democracy. You know, so when the civilians are not delivering, then we don't want the military. So what else do you have? Or are you going to have it? So this is the yes. You've been in the forefront of uh, pro-democracy activism in Nigeria. You're a member of the uh, Joint Task Force. Uh, where you have a situation where you're faced with somebody in the likes of General Sani Abacha and uh, the Equatorial Guinea president. What hope do the ordinary uh, Equatorial Guineans have when they, this uh, opposition is crushed and you see the length they go to? Even in a country like Rwanda, there's a state-sponsored extraterritorial assassination. They go as far as South Africa and uh, Mozambique to assassinate members of the opposition that they seem uh, critical to the regime. Who do you look up to? Evil. Nothing lasts forever, including evil. You know, and evil governments. We, of course, uh, we, we, we saw what happened with um, Jean Bede Bokassa of uh, the Central African Republic. We saw what happened to the mighty Mobutu uh, Seseko, you know, of uh, Zaire. And, and all over Africa and the African, uh, you know, uh, political uh, heartland, we have seen what has happened to wicked dictatorships. We, we, we were here when, when was Mubarak's, uh, Mubarak failed in Sudan. Uh, the, the man in Sudan, it, was, wow. it seemed as if uh, he was uh, impregnable and invincible that nothing could happen to him. Mm. But all of these people were removed by the power of the revolutionary spirits of their people. So sometimes it's a matter of time. It gets to a level where you can no longer, they can no longer sustain the lies for so long. You know, but unfortunately, by the time they are removed from power, they have caused so much destruction in their country. So you just have to start again from the very beginning. You know, so somebody has said that the price we have to pay for democracy is eternal vigilance. And so we have to keep on at it. Yeah, people could also say, yes, perhaps that there is an explanation for that. There's a lining, you know, in the horizon somewhere because it has taken America over 250 years to get to where it is. Same thing with France, same thing with Britain and the rest. You know, so I guess that perhaps we can still talk about, you know, the democracy in Africa being nascent. But we already have a template. So it is not, okay. it's not, we cannot afford, you know, to do 250 years or 200 years of democracy because we be, before we get it right, because lives are at stake. And we need to make sure that, that we push the frontiers, you know, of, uh, you know, of our Absolutely. democracy to get it as quickly as possible to a level where people can actually see 
yes, we have a democracy. Thank you very much for your time and insights, uh, Achike Chude, Global Affairs Analyst. Always a pleasure uh, talking to you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure too. Thanks. Uh, this is where we wrap up the conversation on the conversation today in the first half of the program. We did look at the political situation in Libya with the United Nations as one that if Libya does not conduct elections, it risks being balkanized, and we just concluded our conversation on the upcoming elections in Equatorial Guinea, where the 80-year-old president is seeking a sixth term in office after being in power for 43 years. And Benga Borua, thanks for being a part of the program. And I'm Rita Omodia. Till next week.